I encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, many of you know we're pretty much still uh, in the middle of a series that we're calling Jesus the Healer, where we take individual accounts in Jesus' ministry of healings that took place in Jesus' ministry, and we break them down and we see some truths, we see some principles that if we grab hold of and we put to use in our life, we'll see this, I believe we'll see the same results that came forth in Jesus' ministry. Not only in our lives, but as we minister healing and the Word of God to others. And so that's why we've entitled this series, Jesus is the Healer. Remember, if you remember, at the beginning of this uh, year, we began to talk about faith. And we transitioned right into healing. And faith for healing comes from hearing God's Word concerning healing. Now, if you are deficient in an area of your life where the Word of God is concerned, then you need to feed your faith in that area of your life concerning what God has to say about that. If you want to build that area up, if you are deficient in an area, if you need to build that area up, then you need to feed on the Word of God concerning that area. And I can't think of any two greater areas that we need to continually build ourselves up than healing and provision. Healing and provision. We need to continually be building ourselves up in these things. Why? Because that's where you're going to see the enemy do, this, do his greatest harm. Where the, the enemy is going to bring the greatest attack in your life is in your body and in your finances, in your marriage, whatever it is where provision is concerned, he's going to attack you in those areas. But that's why you can't just turn over all spiritual responsibility to someone else by them just praying for you. You can't just, you, you've got to build yourself up. There is a spiritual responsibility that each and every one of us have, and that is to believe God. Amen. Why? Because God works with faith. God does not work with fear. Now the thing of it is, is fear and faith come the same way. They come by hearing. But faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Fear comes by hearing what the world has to say, about hearing what the news had to say tonight before you came, what the radio, what the magazine, what social media had to say. That's how fear comes into our life. Faith comes by the Word of God. Amen. That's why you need to stop talking about what you don't know, Amen. what you don't have, and what you can't do. Because talking about what you don't know is not going to give you any more knowledge on that subject. If you talk about, well, I just don't know what the Word of God says about healing, that's not going to give you more knowledge concerning healing. What you need to do is entrench yourself, begin to read the Word of God, and allow that knowledge to begin to uh, uh, culminate and build up on the inside of you. Talking about what you can't do is only going to cause yourself to uh, cause you to see yourself as the victim, not the victor. And talking about what you don't have is only going to cause you and produce unthankfulness in your life. That's why you need to take a look at where your life is at right now. And as a matter of fact, we ought to do it right now. Is just lift our hands up and thank God for what He's done in our life. Thank you, Lord, that we are born again, that we have salvation, that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you for being a good God. Thank you for bringing us out of all that you've brought us out of. Thank you for the opportunity to be in church tonight and to give precedence to your word. We have so much to be thankful for. We have so much to look to God and know what he's done in our life. Jesus is our healer. And throughout Jesus' ministry, what you'll find many a times is, is you'll find <coughs> that there were cases where everybody who touched Jesus was healed. And then there were cases where everybody that Jesus touched, they were healed. And then you had instances where everybody in the multitude was healed. We have no reference. We have no, we have no way of knowing how healing was ministered in those times. All we know is, is that the end result was that they were all healed. Amen. Out of the scores of the multitudes and the thousands of healings in Jesus' ministry, He gives us about 20 individual cases. Yeah. 
And that's why these are so significant and why I believe that we should break them down on an individual basis. Why? Because I believe that every question that you, the world, a Christian, a non-believer may have concerning healing can be found in one of these 20 individual cases. And so we're going to read from Matthew chapter 12 and tonight we're going to break down the story of the healing of the man with the withered hand. Now first of all, this account, <coughs> this healing is found in Matthew, it's found in Mark, and it's found in Luke. Luke chapter 6 verses 1 through 11, if you're taking notes you want to go back and read that. Luke chapter 6 verse 1 through 11. And then in Mark chapter 2 verse 23 through chapter 3 verse 12. Now we're only going to center on Matthew even though I may make references to Mark and Luke. Because if we took the time to read all of that we'd probably be here till 9 o'clock. And I know that it's cold outside and we've got to get home. Okay? So with that said we're going to focus on Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 we'll start in verse 1. And it says, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn and His disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. Yeah, so far so good, right? We're looking good so far, right? I mean Jesus, He's just hanging with the disciples. It's the Sabbath day. What's the Sabbath day? It's a day of rest that God created all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning God created the heavens and earth. In six days He created all that we see and all that we know. And then on the seventh day He what? He rested. He called it the Sabbath. And He gave it to His people to observe the Sabbath. Why? So that they could rest. And so here's Jesus. It's the Sabbath. He's just hanging with the disciples. They may be coming from a meeting. They may be on their way to a meeting. They may be going to a family reunion. We don't necessarily know. But he's just hanging with the disciples and they're walking through this cornfield. Now many people also believe that while uh, it may be a grain field or a wheat field, I don't necessarily know you know, one's more relevant than, than the others, but there's some who will say that they were uh, uh, pulling wheat from the vine or corn from the stalk. Either way, they're just going through. They're hungry and they're just looking to eat. And so they're just taking corn, they're taking the wheat, whatever produce it may be, and they're just eating on their way to whatever their destination is. So far, so good, right? Verse 2 But isn't it interesting how quickly things can change? How you can be going one way and all of a sudden in the twinkling of an eye in a moment all of a sudden that situation where you were just laughing, joyful, all of a sudden it changes. But when the Pharisees saw it they said unto him, meaning Jesus, Behold that disciples do which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Once again amazing how quickly things can change. All because people take exception to the way that you're going about doing life. Isn't that amazing? You can be doing life one way and all of a sudden somebody sees you doing life one way, they take exception with it. And all of a sudden they start accusing. All of a sudden they want to know, well why do you do life that way? What gives you the right to do what you're doing? And that's what Jesus is now in the midst of. The Pharisees approach Jesus and they make this issue of, Jesus, why are you and the disciples on the Sabbath day going through this corn or wheat field and doing that which is not lawful? In other words, they are accusing Jesus of breaking the law. In verse 2, he's doing it on the Sabbath. In the latter part, it says, not lawful. These Pharisees, they accuse Jesus of breaking the law. It's important who you run with. It's important who your company is. Here they are, they're hanging with the disciples and all of a sudden the tone and the demeanor of this conversation changes because now they're in proximity or they're in the midst of another group who has taken exception to their way of doing life. It's amazing how people believe they have this gift or this job of correcting other people. That they're the Holy Ghost police. 
James chapter 4, go ahead and turn over there. We'll, we'll see in just a second as I read it. But James chapter 4, you'll see that people who judge one another are not doers. What does the Bible tell us? Be you not hearers only, but what? Doers of the Word. He said, now, now let's not, I mean, let's look at it from, we need to hear the Word of God, because that's how faith comes, but then there's a time that we must do the Word of God. Amen. Judging others is not being a doer. That's it. That's it. Because look at what James chapter 4, verse 10 says. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Humility will keep you from judging other people. Humility will keep you from judging other people. Verse 11, Speak not evil one another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Notice here in verse 11 what this is saying is that speak not evil one another. Well, what were the Pharisees doing? The Pharisees were speaking evil of Jesus. And according to this verse, they were judging the law as a result of speaking evil of their brethren. Time out here. These are experts of the law. These are men and women or uh, individuals who have spent their life from a young age immersing themselves in the law of Moses, in the Old Covenant, memorizing, meditating it. Their whole, their whole reason for being is so that they can interpret the law. And the Bible says right here in James chapter 4 that if you speak of, uh, evil of others, you're judging the law. You're not being a doer, you're judging the law. The very thing that they were representing became the very thing that they judged because of their action, because of their demeanor. Anybody who is quick to judge someone without knowing or without understanding their heart is a hypocrite. At best, you're an armchair quarterback. At worst, you're a hypocrite. Because as, as an armchair quarterback, what do we do on Mondays? Or what do we do on Sundays after the game? Well, man, you know, he should have done it this way. I don't know what that player was thinking. Why didn't he dive? Why didn't he run out of bounds? But you know the truth of the matter is, is you don't know what they were thinking, what that moment on the field was, was like, the intensity, the adrenaline, what the coach had told them to do or not to do. And here we are, we're judging it. But yet we don't understand the intent of the heart of that moment. And at worst, someone's a hypocrite because the very thing that you're accusing someone else of doing, secretly you're doing yourself. And that's what he is saying in this moment. I've made this uh, uh, statement before that pride makes excuses, humility makes adjustments. Well, here the, here's another way of looking at it. Pride makes demands. Humility makes request. Because do, do you not believe that there was another way that these Pharisees could have approached Jesus in this moment? They come to Jesus mad, indignant, making a demand of, why are you doing what you're doing? Isn't another alternative, can we agree that another alternative would have been, excuse me, Jesus, just a moment here. Uh, we're, we're, we're with the Pharisees. We're with such and such synagogue in Jerusalem. And uh, we see that you're walking through this field and you're pulling some grain or some stalk here. Uh, according to the way that we interpret the Word of God, uh, the Old Covenant, that's work. Uh, can you explain to us why you're doing that? Is that not an option that they could have done? Would that not have been a more gentler and kinder way? But there is something indignant about them. There is something hypocritical about them because they are trying to find fault with a man and his company. So what does Jesus do? He re recognizes that they're riled up. He, he recognizes that this is a moment. So we get down to verse 3 back in chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 12. He says, But he, Jesus, said unto them, 
Have you not read what D David did when he was in a hunger, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God, and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest? Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, would, uh, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. Notice three times in verse 3, in verse 5, and in verse 7, three times Jesus refers his distract, detractors, the naysayers, the haters, to the Word of God. Have you not heard? Verse 3. Have you not heard? Verse 5. Verse 7. If you had known what this meant in the Scripture, he's referring to the, to the Word. What a great lesson for you and I. What a great discipline for you and I to get in the habit of. That when haters, naysayers, when an attack comes against you, when pride comes against you, when a company, when a challenge comes against you, just refer it to the Word of God. Amen. Don't take it personally in the sense of, 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 of just, you know, well man, nothing's going my way. Refer it to the Word of God and put the pressure upon the Word of God. And that's ultimately what Jesus did right here. These experts, these so-called experts, are finding fault with Jesus and His disciples because what? They are eating. Why are they eating? They are hungry. They are correct in the sense and in the fact that in the Old Covenant you were not supposed to work on the Sabbath. They are correct, but the attitude that is motivating their approach to Jesus is wrongly motivated. It was the law that you are not supposed to work on the Sabbath, but can we take an honest assessment here and just ask ourselves, were they really working? <laughs> when did eating become work? Amen. They're just hungry. Yeah. They're just wanting to eat. And the, uh, the Pharisees are finding them guilt, uh, guilty of breaking the law. So what does Jesus do? He answers them with the Word of God. That's a great lesson for you and I. We need to answer problems, challenges with the Word of God. Not just one time. We've got to be willing to do it multiple times if need be. Why? Because Satan will continue to chip away, bark at you, challenge you over and over and over when you wake up, when you go to bed, when you wake up in the middle of the night, whatever it may be. You've got to refer it back to the Word of God. And Jesus, in this instance, He's doing it motivated by love out of a pure and right heart, yet He exposes their ignorance of the Word of God. Have you written? I believe Jesus says that in love. But have you written is almost an insult or a slap in the face to these Pharisees. Why? Because they've built their whole life on have I read the Word? Have you read the Word? They've built their whole life on that. And what Jesus is trying to expose them to and show them is, look, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I, I know where you're going with this. But let me show you another vantage point, another viewpoint where this is concerned. You look at us as we're working. Who are you? Your Pharisees, your rulers of the synagogue, what do you do on Sunday? What is what you do considered on Sunday? You sacrifice, you do rituals, you have systems and processes that you go about on Sunday. Isn't that work? And yet he's reminding them that in the Old Testament, once again, while yes, the priests on Sundays, they worked, they were held blameless. They were not found guilty of breaking the law. Why? Because what they're doing is in service Amen. and in honor to God. Amen. And helping the people come into the presence yes. and come into the throne room and be ushered into the very throne room of God. Amen. And he's saying, look, you're saying this about us, but let's flip this around. 
what you're doing is considered more work than what we're doing, and yet you're held blameless, but you're wanting to blame me for this. Jesus is simply asking them to reconsider their viewpoint. That's why you and I, we've got to stay humble. And we've got to see and consider things that we haven't seen in the Word of God before. That's why it is dangerous to hang on to your version of the truth. Well, this is my truth. What if your truth is wrong? And what if God or someone who God is using can expose you to what is false about that? Are you open enough to receive correction? That's the danger. That's the danger of these kind of moments. Because I believe Jesus would ask this the same question when we're maybe in a struggle, when we're facing a mountain, when we're wondering what to do. I believe he would ask us the same question. Have you read? When was the last time you read? Are you willing to read what I have to say about this matter? Are you willing to listen to me and let me show you what Mark eleven twenty three 23 says to do in the middle of a challenge? And be corrected where your version of the truth is concerned. Are we willing to make those kind of adjustments? And not get tripped up on the law of these kind of things. Remember that the new covenant command is what? It's love. It's love. What does love mean? Love, for tonight, it means to value. Love values people. Love not only values people, God's love, real love, values people being well. It values people being healed. And these experts are emphasizing the law above, above, uh, above love. Amen. Lawful or not lawful is the main issue in this text, yeah. in this healing. As a matter of fact, if you want to write these numbers down, feel more than welcome to. But in Luke chapter 6, the Sabbath, the word Sabbath is mentioned six times. The word lawful is used three times. In Mark chapter 2, in the same story, the Sabbath is mentioned seven times, and lawful is mentioned three times. In Matthew, the one that we're reading from, the Sabbath is mentioned eight times, lawful or not lawful is mentioned four times. When it comes to this healing that we're about to read about, wrapped up within it is the major issue of these Pharisees struggling when it comes to the subject of healing and about you and I receiving healing about the Sabbath and about law or not lawful. That's the major issue with these guys. But you've got to remember, Jesus did not come teaching the law. Look at Matt, look, I mean, you don't have to turn back there, but if you want to know more about this, look back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, what is Jesus doing? He's saying, does the old law say this? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not divorce your wife. I say this. He's saying the old covenant says this. I'm here introducing a new testament, a new covenant based on love. The Bible tells us that the old law was up until John the Baptist. Jesus came introducing the new law, the New Testament, what you and I are experiencing today. They, Jesus was not, Jesus was not contradicting the truth of the law. What he was doing was revealing the spirit yeah. <coughs> that he wants you and I to operate with in this world. Jesus was not emphasizing the letter of the law. He was emphasizing the spirit behind how you and I operate within that law. And that is love. Verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Now this right here clarifies so much. It clarifies so much where healing, where the Word of God is concerned. God did not create you and I to support religion and the earth. God created the earth and the Sabbath, which is a day of rest for you and for I. In direct connection with rest is restoration. Hence the root word in restoration of rest. 
in direct, a direct connection of rest and recovery. All you've got to do is go Google this on, on somewhere, ask whoever, a doctor, Google, whatever. Some of the, some of the, a lot, many physical issues today that people are experiencing are due to a lack of rest where their body is concerned. And yet over in Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus, God is telling us, enter in to that rest. As a matter of fact, He's given you a day of rest, the Sabbath. And yet you've got so many people who don't want to observe it because they want to get as much work as they can possibly done, and they fry their brains, and they break down their bodies because they never take a day of rest. With today's technology, it is so easy to stay up all night making sure you don't, the FOMO, fear of missing out on any of social media. Man, I, you know, I, I don't want to miss what's happening in other parts of the world. I don't want to miss who died, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, in, su- in, in such and such or so and so. I want to be caught up and I don't want to miss a thing. And they're sitting there at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And they're not giving their brain a rest, giving themselves a rest mentally. And because they think they've got so much to do, they'll push through the weekend, they'll push through Sunday, they'll skip church. Ouch! All because I've got to get this done, I've got to get this done. And God is saying, if you'll just work within what I've set in motion, take a day of rest, I promise you, all the, the desires of your heart, if you'll just delight in me, you'll see come to pass in your life. If we just rest. So we get down to verse 9. And when he, Jesus, departed thence, he went again, or he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. Now, interesting because Mark and Luke do not record it this way. What they record is, is that they watched Jesus to see if they would heal him. Heal this man with the withered hand. In Matthew, we see something different. But I find it very interesting how Mark and Luke record this. They watched to see if Jesus would heal this man. I'm going to say that again. Maybe you'll you'll see between the lines here. The Pharisees, the detractors, the ones who were out to kill Jesus, they were watching to see if Jesus would heal this man. They were watching because of a response here based off a question that we find in chapter, uh, excuse me, in Matthew, they're watching because in Matthew's account, they asked a question, Jesus gave a response, they're watching. They're watching to see if Jesus was going to heal this man. Unfortunately, that's more than a lot of churchgoers do today. They're watching to see And yet you've got people who come in church wondering if it's the will of God to even heal. Yet you've got haters that are watching uh, to see if Jesus will heal because they believe He will heal. And yet you've got people who come in church and wonder, can I be healed today? Can Jesus heal me? Is it God's will that I be healed? Even Jesus' distractors believed that Jesus could heal. Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? As we step through these doors, regardless of the sickness or disease, whatever it may be, first of all, you've always got to settle the question of if if it's God's will in your life or not. And once you've settled that, coming in, don't ask yourself, well, will I get it today? No, if Jesus is here, His heart is that you leave healed and whole in the name of Jesus. Now in Matthew, we see that they asked him this question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? They actually challenged Jesus concerning healing. They challenged Jesus concerning 
this upcoming healing of this man with the withered, withered hand. Notice that their excuse is, they asked him saying, is it lawful to heal? They didn't stop there. They said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Satan will use any excuse he can in your life to keep you from receiving your healing. He'll use, whether it's the will of God in your life, he'll use your past, he'll use your present, he'll use your future, he'll use whatever excuse he can in your life to try to get you to question whether it's God's will to heal you or not and to keep you from getting your healing. And that's exactly what they're doing there. They're not saying, is it lawful to heal? They're saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? What does Revelation 12, 10 say about Satan? It says that he is the accuser of the brethren. brethren. That is somebody you do not want to partner with. Because if you yield yourself to that, then you yield yourselves to the spirits that are behind that. And you become accusatory. You become accuser of the brethren. And there are so many, in the, uh, unfortunately, that are among Christians that are content to be that because it goes back to they believe their gift and their job is to correct people concerning the Word of God and be the Holy Ghost police. And so we see right here that he's the accusing of the brethren. We don't want to yield to that. Why? Because what does John 10, 10 say? That the thief, Satan, comes to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Accusations are meant to destroy. And everybody in this room probably can think of an instance where an accusation has destroyed an individual. It has destroyed a marriage. It has destroyed a family. It has destroyed a church. It has destroyed the company that you're working for. Real or not real, true or not true, all it takes these days, as it seems, is just an accusation. And that's what God is saying. That's what Jesus is telling them here. That's what they're throwing out there, is that they're accusing of Jesus of breaking the law. Verse 11, And Jesus said unto them, what man should there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath? Now, that's interesting because, first of all, if you, if, if you like statistics, five out of the 20 individual cases of healing in Jesus' ministry Five of them bring up this issue, of, uh, it, excuse me, of the issue of is it legal for you to heal on the Sabbath day? This is one of them. Uh, Luke chapter, I wrote these down, Luke chapter 13, the woman with the spirit of infirmity, she was healed on the Sabbath day. Luke chapter 14, the man with the dropsy, he was healed on the Sabbath day. John chapter 9, the blind man at the pool was healed on the Sabbath day. And then you have the lame man at the pool. Guess what? He was healed on the Sabbath day. And, and they're bringing up this, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Jesus now turns it around to them and says, is it lawful, the latter part of verse 12, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath day? You're asking me, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Now I'm going to ask you, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath day? And if you look at uh, Mark and Luke's account, they'll say, which is, uh, which is more lawful, to do good or to do evil, to do life or to do death? And notice what he, what he explains this with, how he relates this. He says, what one of you who have a sheep, and it's amazing the number of times, if you'll study this out, how many times God will use animals in comparison to healing. He talks about don't, mu don't muzzle an ox when it's treading. Allow it to eat. If you allow it to eat, then guess what? It'll help bring in the harvest. He talks about a donkey, and he talks about sheep. And right here he's talking about sheep in the, in the, in the instance of how many of you on the Sabbath... If a sheep went wandering off and fell into a pit, would just leave that sheep, that uh, sheep uh, or that lamb or whatever uh, in, in that pit to die. <coughs> He's asking them this question, turning this situation around on them, because Jesus brought up animals 
in distress multiple times when it came to somebody being healed. Why? Because you shouldn't see healing any differently than helping an animal in distress. You shouldn't see it any differently. That's how easy it is to understand the heart of God. Because I dare say there's not an individual in here that if you saw an animal truly in distress, you wouldn't try to find some way to assist that animal. You know that you're not going to teach Fido a lesson by just leaving him hanging on the wire. I forget if it was earlier this year or whether it was uh, last year, but Tara and I, we're getting ready to go to bed, and the minute we're going into our bedroom, Tara shouts at me, she says, hey David, come here, and Buddy, our, our golden doodle, our third child, is laying in the floor, and he is undergoing a seizure, a violent seizure. Now we had known that his parents, I think it was his dad, was it his dad? His dad was prone to seizures. And so they, 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 uh, they, they, they made this known to us when we bought the dog, but he was probably four, you know, probably three or four years before we, this, anything like this had ever happened. And so this is new to us. And so this buddy is undergoing this seizure. You know what I didn't do? I didn't say, hey, Tara, Trent, Clay, y- y'all come here a second. Uh, I know we've got a situation going on right here. But uh, um, let's pray and find out if this is the will of God where this situation is concerned. I didn't do that. Um, I, didn't, I didn't say, hey, Tara, Trent, Clay, uh, let's take a moment and everybody just, you know, within yourself, see if there's a lesson that God is trying to teach us as Buddy is sitting here having this seizure. I didn't do that. You know what I did? I got down there with him. I put my hand on him, and I began to speak the peace of God over him. Why? Because a righteous man regards the life of his beast. I regard the life of animals. I began to pray for him. That seizure began to abate over the course of an hour. He had a few other ones, but they got smaller and smaller, less and less in intensity. As a precaution, we took him to the, uh, uh, the vet, the emergency vet that night to see if there was an underlying issue that we didn't know that maybe we needed to treat. Came back clean. And since then, because when we were on the way home, we said, we're done with that. Yeah. We're not going to have that happen again. Amen. Buddy, moving forward, you are a dog who operates, lives, you live in a home of peace because I've got a wife who, who makes a home of peace. Therefore, you're going to be up under that peace. Amen. We're not going to have this again. And guess what? We haven't had another episode. Amen. And we're not going to have another episode. Amen. But there are people who believe, that, I'll put it this way, people believe that people are kinder to their animals than God is to His children. And that is untrue. That is untrue. People believe that people will be kinder to their animals than God will to a son or a daughter. And that is a lie. That is untrue. Verse 13. Then saith he, Jesus, we get now into the healing of this man. Then saith he to the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Now in Luke's account, I believe it's Luke's account, Jesus tells this man to rise, to come forth, and then to stretch forth his hand. I find that significant because I I believe it's in Matthew and Mark that you just see this phrase, stretch forth thine hand. I actually like the way Luke says it because I believe that Jesus is also demonstrating something in those other, in those three things that he told them. Rise, come forth to me, and stretch forth thine hand. I believe Jesus is interested in you coming up out of whatever situation that has got you stuck. I believe Jesus wants to cause you to rise up 
whatever it is that is oppressive and weighing you down in life. And I believe He's calling you forth out of religion. He's calling you forth out of a company of people who would try to berate you, who would try to demean you by telling you that, well, the Word of God says this, the Word of God says that, you've got to do this, this is the law, the Word says this, the Word says that. God is just wanting you to come out of that religious stuff and be in His presence and just be, in, and just be with Him. And then He tells them, stretch forth thine hand. Now, a couple of things here. I find it interesting that with Jesus healing this man, this man, with Jesus and the healing of this man's withered hand, it was, I put it, with Jesus, this man was worthy of being healed even though he was just hurt. How much more so to someone who's dealing with a life-threatening disease? Jesus, this man, all all that was wrong, and I'm not belittling this, all that was wrong is that his, now Luke, Luke says, and that's Luke because he's the physician, he's the detailed one, Luke tells us that it's his right hand. Matthew and Mark don't say that. Luke says it's his right hand. And Jesus, I mean, this is something, a right hand, obviously he was able to walk to the temple. Obviously, this is probably probably not something that keeps him from working. He may not be able to do every job in the phone book. He may not not be able to do every job that, you know, is available out there. But for the majority of things, guess what? This is just more of an inconvenience than it is a life or death situation. But yet to Jesus... Even though this man was hurting, he was worthy to be healed of Jesus. That's why, whether you've got an ingrown toenail, a broken toe, a broken elbow, a headache, you are still worthy of Jesus working in your life. It doesn't take a dire situation, a life or death moment for Jesus just to operate. If you're hurting, you're worthy to see the power of God move in your life. Jesus also, notice what he asked of this man. He said, stretch forth thine hand. Notice he did not say, extend your arm. A lot of times when we we think stretch forth thine hand, that's what we think. This right here. He did not ask him, to extend his arm. He said, stretch forth thine hand. Jesus asked him to take a step of faith like he did with so many others. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Go dip in the pool. He told this man to stretch forth thine hand. Now, where this is concerned... This man's hand was not restored, allowing him to stretch forth his hand. He stretched forth his hand, allowing his hand to be fully restored. Big difference. Big difference. Jesus asked him to take a step of faith. He didn't say extend your arm. He said stretch forth your hand. When did the restoration show up? When did the whole, uh, complete, and total healing package show up? When he stretched forth his hand. When he took the step of faith that God asked him to take. It wasn't Jesus restoring his hand and then the man was able to open up his hand. No, he took a step of faith, began to open up that which was closed up in his life, and he met the healing power of God. So many of us, we want to get healed, and then we'll get up out of bed. We want to get healed, and then we'll go back to work. And yet Jesus may be telling you, if you'll just take a step of faith, if you'll just walk to the car, open the door, get in, drive to work, I'll be with you. And by the time you get there, if you'll do these things that I need of you, I'm wanting to prove myself to you, show you my power and might in your life. If you'll do these things, 
you'll see the healing power of God in demonstration in your life. When this man reached the end of his ability with this command of stretch forth thine hand, he met the power of God instantly in his life. What a powerful truth. And then we get to verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. Amazing! In all seriousness, this is a laughable moment, but in all seriousness, they saw the healing power of God. And their solution is to kill Jesus now. I mean, what more does it take to prove that this is the Son of God? They see this healing, and then all of a sudden, now their attitude is, we're going to kill Jesus. All this disagreement is in the context of a man with a withered hand. And we need to know that God is more concerned about your needs than he is about the law, or about the observance of a law. Why do we say that? Because if you'll allow me to read it real quick, in Luke chapter 6, you don't have to turn there, but it says, I'm sorry, maybe it's Mark. Mark. Mark chapter 2. It says, have you never read what David did when he was in need? David was in need. What did he do? He went into the temple. The Bible says in verse 25, what David did when he had need, verse 26, he went into the house of God. That is an entirely different message that we could spend weeks upon. When you're in need, so many people are turning to the world. When you're in need, the best place that you can run is to the house of God. And the Bible says in Matthew that it talks about, it doesn't use the word need. It says, when David was hungered, what did he do? He went to the house of God. You feel empty? You need to be filled? You need to be satisfied? Don't turn to the world. Turn to the house of God. Because that's where you're going to be filled with that which pleases and satisfies you and fills you. I had a friend, and I'm closing with this. I had a friend, he texted me, they're from California, their names are, uh, well, I'll tell you, I, I know that she's been here, but their names are Gus and Nicolette Castro. We met them when we were out in uh, 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 California, great friends of ours, keep in touch with them. But Gus sent me a text of his daughter, I forget her name, Carly, is that her name? Her name is Carly. She attends uh, Hillsong College, I believe. And she had a devotion uh, one morning. And somebody recorded it. I don't know if it was his parents or not, but somebody, uh, her parents or not, somebody recorded it and he sent me the clip of it. And I thought she made a great observation. She said this. She said that she woke up one morning, she was just spending time with God, and this question rose up in her. And the question was, are you hungry for God or are you feeding the devil? Are you hungry for God or are you feeding the devil? Because if you're hungry for God, then the place that you're going to be filled is in the house of God. If you're feeding the devil, then guess what? That indicates that you're doing it the world's way because you're feeding him everything that he needs in order to get into the, the intricacy of your life and do everything he can to topple it and bring it down. So what, would you, what was Jesus' answer to this? What was Jesus' answers to them going out and seeking his own death? In verse 15, it says, um, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Here they are. They're, they, they go out and say, you know what? We're going to kill Jesus. What does he do? He turns around and he says, all right, that's the way you're going to play it double. If you're going to go ahead and set this thing in motion where my death is concerned, I'm going to go out and heal the multitudes. That's Jesus' attitude about it. And then we come down to verse, verse 20. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoke and flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, 
and his name shall the Gentiles trust. Now you may ask, what in the world does that have to do with the healing of the man with the withered hand? A smoking flax is barely a flame. It's barely a flame. And what God is saying here is, is he's not going to quench that flame. But he's going to fan it to where it becomes a flame, a strong flame. A bruised reed is a reed that has been over. God is not going to break that. God does not look at the bruised or the hurting or those whose fire is almost out and say to them, You've, you, you're too far gone. There's no hope for you. And that's the way a lot of people feel in the world right now. They're bruised on the inside. They're bruised because of sickness and disease. They feel broken. They feel like their fire is about to go out. And Jesus is letting you know that you are not too far gone. Is healing good or evil? It's good. How do we know that? Because Jesus what? Went about doing good. You should not have to wrestle with that. And one of the most powerful points I love about this story is remember what they accused him of? They accused him of breaking the Sabbath. But did you notice what Jesus healed this man with? Jesus never touched the man. All he did was speak the word. If we're going to get legalistic about it, wouldn't laying hands be considered maybe some work? Maybe at least a little bit more effort where a priest was concerned? Jesus never broke the law. He never laid hands on the man. I'm not saying he's trying to circumvent it. It just shows you the creative genius of God. Okay, you're looking at me to work this. Be healed. The Word. And that's as simple as it is for you and for I. Jesus is the healer.